Given how expansive and full of interesting characters its long-running mythology is, the popular British sci-fi series Doctor Who has had a surprisingly small number of official spin-off series during its 60-year-plus history. That makes it even more impressive that one particular supporting character managed three separate Who spin-offs in two different decades. That would be K-9, the Doctor's occasional robotic K-9 companion, who was first introduced to the show in 1977 in a move clearly designed to appeal to younger fans. In 1981, a pilot was filmed for a spin-off called K-9 and Company, which saw K-9 teamed with Elizabeth Sladen's Sarah Jane, at the time the Doctor's most popular human companion. Broadcast as a Christmas special, the pilot actually received higher ratings than Doctor Who itself did at the time, but oddly was still not picked up to series. But Sladen and her robotic co-star would get a second, more successful shot at the concept during Doctor Who's mid-2000s revival, when the two characters were reintroduced together in an episode, followed by the 2007 spin-off series The Sarah Jane Adventures, which ran for five seasons before Sladen's tragic death from cancer cut the series short. K-9 was only an occasional guest star in that show, but before you feel too bad for the Robodog, it's important to note this was largely because, at the time, his own spin-off series was being developed. That show, unsurprisingly titled K-9, and aimed at even younger viewers, aired one season starting in 2009. Due to some contractual loopholes, the show was not a BBC production, and in fact was unable to directly reference Doctor Who at all. Poor ratings and reviews led to its quick demise. And while it's been quite some time since K-9 has appeared in modern Doctor Who, the BBC still sells K-9 merchandise, and he remains a beloved part of the franchise for many fans. But then, maybe that's not surprising, as the entire concept of a loyal robotic dog has long been a fixture of sci-fi, so much so that it's even crossed over into the real world. As early as 1940, the Westinghouse Company developed a robotic pet dog called Sparko, though low public interest meant the product never actually hit the market. But ultimately, robotic dogs, of increasing mechanical complexity and intelligence, have become available. And while they haven't necessarily overtaken the real living thing as the go-to pet of choice for the general populace, today, robotic dogs such as Sony's Ibo series are commonly utilized as pets for elderly persons living alone or in nursing homes, as well as individuals whose medical and physical needs would make interacting with living dogs difficult. As the marketplace's robotic dogs have grown increasingly more advanced, They've not surprisingly also grown more expensive, which prevents them from becoming too common of a household feature. In fact, Boston Dynamics quadrupedal robot Spot, one of the more famous real-life robotic dogs thanks to numerous viral videos of it attempting to perform certain tasks, was originally conceived as a commercial product with potential large-scale plans for everyday consumers. But its $75,000 price tag has meant it's instead ended up primarily an industrial tool for companies, and even police forces, such as the Massachusetts State Police, who use Spot as part of their bomb squad. Still, no matter the exorbitant prices or our cultural familiarity with fictional tales of domesticated robots gone bad, such as the 2017 Black Mirror episode Metalhead, which follows a woman terrorized by robotic dogs clearly inspired by Boston Dynamics models, the notion of owning a robotic pet will always be alluring to many, whether it be from a love of living a real-life sci-fi scenario, or maybe just the appeal of a pet who won't pass away, and doesn't come with the same sort of biological necessities as an actual animal. After all, if having a robotic dog is cool enough for a thousands-year-old space-traveling time lord such as the Doctor, who are we to think any different? The year is 2018, and Global Road Entertainment and Lakeshore Entertainment are ready to allow a young filmmaker to expand his successful online short into what they hope will be the next big family adventure sci-fi franchise with Axel. <laughs> Welcome once again to Failure to Franchise, the show dedicated to some of Hollywood's most infamous mistakes, missteps, and misfires. This is Trev. And I'm Covert Hedonistic Reconnaissance International Specialist, a.k.a. Chris. I was hoping you were going to do one of those. And as <laughs> I thought about, should I give myself one? I was like, no, I, I won't step on what Chris is probably going to do. But, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a cliche, that's what you're telling me? Pretty much. Oh, do you have an acronym for cliche? Give me 25 minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Canadian liar. Uh, uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. international. I use it again. <laughs> I was gonna say idiot, but yeah, oh yeah, international too. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, uh, don't be fooled by me just calling Chris an idiot. Uh, <laughs> we can just pivot from that. We mm-hmm. should talk about how this is the second episode in our month-long, uh, you know, series celebrating the power of friendship. That's yes. right. It's friendruary. <laughs> yes, I love it. Love it. Yeah, it just rolls off the tongue every time. Yeah, you gotta yeah, love it. Yeah. Friendjuary. So, so last time on Friendjuary, we looked at a uh, a 1988 movie. <laughs> First of all, that is so. That what a funny sentence. Did you ever think <laughs> that you'd ever say last time on Friendjuary? <laughs> no, I didn't because Friendjuary is a made up word. So of course I never expected that. <laughs> That's great. Uh, great. But last time on Friendjuary, we looked at 1988's Mac and Me, a mm-hmm. uh, a bad movie that is nonetheless stood stood the test of time. And today is like well known, has a cult following, you know, recurring joke on Conan O'Brien, thanks to Paul Rudd. Just a, you mm-hmm. know, kind of one of those like those classic bad movies that just hangs on and, and stays in the in the ether. And this time we're looking at a movie from a few years ago that nobody remembers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, that, and to show the two extremes of how these kind of these kind of films can go, and that is 2018's Axel. No, not the candidate receptor for SARS COVID two that promotes infection of pulmonary and bronchial cells. Not that Axel. But instead, <laughs> wow. I like to, <laughs> wow. yeah, you're, you're welcome. Uh, but no, this is actually Axel A dot X dot L dot. So Chris, why don't you tell us about this movie, 2018's Axel? For sure. Uh, it is written and directed by one Oliver Daly. Uh, this is his first and only feature. Um, to date, the, to date. Let's to give date. some time. I guess you're right. It is only like six years ago. So uh, the budget of the film is $10 million. Uh, domestically, it made six point five million, and worldwide, oof, uh, it made eight point four million. Uh, this movie barely had promotion, and then it was just dropped and forgot. Uh, yeah. That's how I feel about it. Even in the lead up to this movie, me and you, I think, recognized the poster in some way, shape, or form. But also, the poster is kind of reminiscent uh, of like other things as well. So, I mean. This uh, left uh, quicker than it came, honestly. Well, that that was what this movie was to me. It was just a poster. So we can just quickly say this is a movie about a boy and his robotic dog, essentially. Yeah. It's yeah. a robo-dog movie. Um, and I remember, you know, you know, as a regular theater goer, just suddenly at one point seeing this poster in the theater. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And being like, what is that? <laughs> you know, and never seeing a trailer for it. I don't. I never saw a trailer for Axel attached to any movie I saw in 2018. But suddenly the poster was there. It was there for a couple months, and then it was gone. And it was just like, oh, did that ever come out? Whatever happened with that movie? You know. So it was just this thing where, like, I guess that's a movie that's happening, but mm-hmm. it was more or less like it didn't exist. And as you said, uh, obviously we now know it did come out, but it still really doesn't exist. Um, so we're we, here to we... we're we're here to not only talk about it, but also just to let people know. This is a movie that actually was produced, filmed, made, and released. <laughs> Dude, we didn't even know this movie existed, and we talked about Thomas Jane a few months ago. I know. Uh, not even a few months ago, a few weeks ago uh, in The Punisher, and he is in this film playing yes. dad. Uh, it is very, very weird. So, Com- yeah, uh, total coincidence. That was not planned at all because we no. didn't know. Uh, you, I, we didn't know there were actors in this movie. You could, this could have been animated for. <laughs> well, no, I guess that's not true because we did talk about the one thing I remember clocking on the poster, and I know we'll talk about this. And I think I mentioned it to you in the, the lead up this episode. Was yeah. Every time I saw the poster, I always did a double take and was like, "Is that Taylor Kitsch?" Is mm-hmm, that Taylor Kitsch mm-hmm, with the Robo mm-hmm. Dog? Like that's what I always thought looking at the poster. Um, uh, no, it's not. Uh, Taylor Kitsch is not in this movie, but that's just what I always thought. It's and actually we'll talk... it's actually Emil Hirsch. Oh yeah, I yeah, know. <laughs> he's this kid. It's like they took Taylor Kitsch, Emil Hirsch, and um, what's his name? Decker Montgomery. Is that him? Or like it's the, oh, I know Power Rangers and Stranger Things. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They threw all, they threw those three into a blender and, and created this kid. Um, yeah, for sure. But, yeah, yeah. yeah, and we don't like to talk shit about actors, but. Uh... He does look like other actors put together. He does. <laughs> There's a couple actors in this that look like other actors. Yes, yes. Anyway, uh, mm-hmm. how did this movie even happen? Like, again, like, like, there's not a lot of backstory to this movie because it did just kind of happen. Yeah. Um, and the reason it happened was this still does uh, occur from time to time in today's modern uh, filmmaking Hollywood process. But there was a time for at least a decade or two that... Proof of concept films or short films were were you know commonplace you know like just to name a few Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow 
started as a proof of concept short film on YouTube. Uh, Zack Snyder made one for 300 called Die Free, and then he got 300 greenlit because of that. Um, uh, similarly, uh, Robert Rodriguez got Sin City greenlit because he made something called uh, The Customer is Always Right. Uh, and then probably the most famous one and something that is cited by the filmmaker Oliver Daly here is Alive in Joburg, uh, directed by Neil Blomkamp, who made um, District 9. So that was the movie that incepted District 9. Now, this movie, Axel, started as a 2015 short film proof of concept, Miles. Yeah, well, I think there's one other really famous one that we should mention, too, if we're talking about this, and, and just to talk about this idea a little bit more of, you know, proof of concept leading a movie, and that would be, of course, Deadpool. Don't forget that Oh, one, totally. Too. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I completely forgot about that. Because, you know, all that bullshit of it being leaked, and somebody stole it, yeah, yeah, and it yeah, wasn't yeah. actually Ryan Reynolds, and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So, uh, now, this yeah. is like, that. I mean, I know we'll talk about Miles in a moment, but just to, to talk about this this concept of proof of concept, <laughs> of this, <laughs> this idea of, you know, like, because w- one thing we should mention, the... the this, the backstory of this movie is interesting in that regard. Mm-hmm. But some of those ones you mentioned, you know, Robert Rodriguez, Zack Snyder, they were already names at the sure. point. Of, so they just had to, like, kind of prove that they could, you know, they were thinking of something, like, a little visually different than what Hollywood was doing. It is a little bit more impressive when it is someone like um, a Neil Blomkamp, who at that point was not a name yet. Or in this case, like an Oliver Daly. You know, some just young go-getter who says, like, I have an idea for a movie. I think I could make it, but I need to prove I can do it, like, on a smaller level first Mm -hmm, before mm -hmm. anyone can can like you know give me the money and before hollywood will sign off on it and honestly you said it's like you know been going on for the last decade or like decade plus it's the kind of thing where you know obviously some of those movies you just mentioned were successful some were very successful and some like axel and sky captain are failure to franchise episodes sky captain coming soon uh, or some i don't know what soon (laughs) but at some point (laughs) but i mean it do you agree that i actually really love this idea and it's something i wish would happen more right because we talk about how nowadays everybody can make a movie, right? Everybody's got an iPhone, um, you know, everybody's got access to like editing software. And that was supposed to be the great democratization of filmmaking, you mm-hmm. know, like, oh, oh this is going to what's it's going to what's open up like to where people are making feature length movies that are just as good as Hollywood stuff in their backyard with their their editing tools. And we've seen a little bit of that happen. But in general, we've really seen, obviously, and we've talked about a lot on this show, Hollywood clamp down on the IP it actually gives money to and the kind of movies it makes and, and releases on the studio level. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it would actually be great if studios are were looking for the next IP more often and were going to YouTube and looking at these like short films that these, you know, these non these unknown filmmakers were making. Mm-hmm. So I kind of gotta give it to Oliver Daly just for getting this movie made off of Miles. Now we can we can talk about that process and everything. But yeah, it's something I wish happened. I, I like whenever I see a story like that about someone actually getting their short film turned into a big Hollywood movie. Well that was so cool about something like Kickstarter, right? Like mm-hmm. Miles came out of Kickstarter. I the 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 campaign started in 2014. It had 190 backers. Uh, he uh, got something just over forty three thousand dollars to make it, and I mean Kickstarter. It feels like nobody really talks about Kickstarter much anymore. Hey, like it sounds like GoFundMe is is more of a thing, but that yeah. seems to be more like donation wise. But Kickstarter, the only thing that I can think of recently is, uh, do you know that YouTuber Chris St- Struckman or Stuckman? Yeah. Um, he kickstarted a movie a couple years back, and I think that movie's not even released yet. I, I believe it's finished. But people are like eagerly awaiting his directorial debut. Uh, for people that don't know, Chris Struckman is like is a is a YouTube uh, like vlogger that reviews films. Uh, he's been mm-hmm. doing it for like ten, a long time now, and he's quite unless the, they're Madam Web. I that's so funny you bring that up because yeah you're right I did see that too he refuses to say anything bad about that well, he, movie like he's in hot water for that uh, we, we could do a little side tangent here uh, sure people need to get off of Chris Struckman's ass on that because he's not a movie <laughs> critic he's just a guy on YouTube who talks about movies he likes or doesn't like in some cases but if you watch the whole video he actually explains himself very well he basically just says like everybody's oh, hey, Trev 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 watch the whole video I know, and I read know. the whole article <laughs> come it's, on it's just so funny because everyone's mad at him because they're basically mad at him because they just felt like he should continue the pile on that madam webb was getting as if it it doesn't have enough yeah and all he's like saying in the video is like well i'm not going to talk about the same way i'm not going to blame the filmmaker i think this movie is more indicative of a problem with like what the studios are doing now Mm -hmm. and the negative influence that studios have on filmmakers and everyone's like how dare you not join us and just saying it's the worst movie of all time uh don't worry eventually chris and i will get there (laughs) but (laughs) but yeah i don't know just one of those dumb little internet controversies that means nothing yeah very very strange 
Yeah. But uh, but yeah, Kickstarter is is a is a cool tool. Um, it, like Trevor's saying, it's it's uh, always a nice uh, story to hear somebody like Oliver Daly get this thing off the ground, um, get some people excited about it, and then get the interest of you know people like David S. Goyer. You know, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, I don't know. Do you want to talk a little bit about what this short is? Um, our well, feelings yeah, that's on the, it. That's the thing. We can talk about how it's it's really cool that like he got this made new movie, but like let's talk about the short in general. And, and I guess I just start by you know I went to the actual Kickstarter page for it, which is still up because they they remain up, you know, to mm-hmm. show their success. Yeah. Um, and Chris, I just want to read you the little description of Miles that is on the Kickstarter page. You and I both watched this short, correct? As mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. Watching Excel. Yep. Uh, it says, Miles is a movie about blurring the boundaries between humanity and technology set in the off-roading world of Central California. Hmm. Do you agree with me that that sounds a little more highfalutin than what we really get in this short film? Uh, I, 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 I don't know that there's anything about the short where I go, wow, this is really blurring the boundaries between this... humanity and technology. This is more like a guy who's like, you know what? I like uh, I like motorbikes, and I think a robot dog is cool, and I'm just going to show that for five minutes. It, Trev, barely. Yeah. <laughs> it's more about I like dirt biking, and I also like rolling in a bed with my girlfriend. Um <laughs> That you know, th- this short actually stars one Alexa Demi. Uh, she is on Euphoria for all you Euphoria heads out there. Uh, she plays Maddie, and I watched this short film, which is just like I had a short film. Even the word "film" is hard to mm-hmm. bring myself to say because it's five and a half minutes or so, and I kept asking myself, "Is this actually a passion project?" <laughs> Like, or is this just a shameless attempt at recreating Neil Blomkamp's, like, career trajectory? Because it's handheld cinematography, just like, you know, Joe Berg. You know, you add a CGI character, and then you profit, right? This short film has no plot. It has no story. It has nothing. Mm -hmm. And even the little logline from the Kickstarter is, it's a lie. (laughs) Like it's a lie. It, it, it talks about. There's even more. Uh, let me let me read this here. Um, what does it say? Miles explores Max's ability, which Max at this point that's the name of the dog um, ability, and uh, the creature quickly develops into something fiercely loyal, intelligent, and nearly unstoppable. Uh, soon he discovers that Max was developed in absolute secrecy as a remotely controllable beast, engineered to replace American soldiers on the front lines and kill autonomously. Uh, As Max becomes less conspicuous, and as their bond grows stronger, Miles is forced to make decisions that will affect not only his life, but also the lives of those closest to him. Trev, none of that is in the movie. No, it's not. Yeah, that's like, <laughs> like you you have to like find you have to discover the story of this short by reading it on Kickstarter. Otherwise, yeah. it, it really like so when we say proof of concept, this is literally just proof of concept. This is him sh- saying, "Hey, look, I know where to point a camera." I know like what cinematography is. I know how to film exciting dirt biking scenes and I can create this robo dog essentially, you know? Yeah. So you, you understand that's where it all came from. Like obviously he already had this story in mind because he put on the Kickstarter page, but the, the short he made was more just about, I guess, proving I can conceptual, I can visually conceptualize these things and then visually deliver them too. Mm-hmm. D- doesn't it feel like a little bit of a con? It's it's tough to say because you know we're gonna talk about what whatever we think about the movie mm-hmm. we do know he got the movie made right and the movie is the story you just said so sure. it's it's it is hard to say because I don't know that you know uh, there have definitely been kickstarters that have felt like cons uh, <laughs> Zach Braff um, and you know other cases but. <laughs> This one, it's it's tough to say. I, I I know what you mean just because the short doesn't really deliver on what he's promising in the description on Kickstarter. Right. But he obviously people were taken with it enough. They they loved Max the Robo Dog or whatever, and then maybe they thought the the idea sounded cool. He got the money, eventually got that Hollywood attention, and he did make the movie he promised to make. Right. So sure. Yeah. Tough that's fair. tough call. But yeah, there is still it's still kind of funny that the short does not really deliver on what he's saying it will in the, in the description. Yeah. How do you feel about Neil Blomkamp? Let's, let's talk about that a little bit because like, I, I think, you know, I never saw the Joe Berg documentary. I don't think I saw that short film or maybe I did because, but it was so long ago at this point. Yeah, I, um, I saw it, but I don't really remember it. Yeah. No. But like district nine, uh, I think it's safe to say that we both think is awesome. Um, mm-hmm. And his still to date, his best by far movie. Yeah. Um, but he's had a rough go too, you know, like, you know, District 9 hit was nominated for, you know, Best Picture, which is crazy. 
That that was the year I think they they made it. You can make ten ten. Yeah, movies, it was right? the Dark Knight yeah. rule here. Yeah. Right, right, right. So that movie hits. He gets to make a bunch more. Funnily enough, they all subsequently fail in their own way. You know, some financially, some critically. I don't think none of them were were really meant to start off franchises. So I'm not sure if we'll ever talk about them. But Neil Blomkamp himself has had a tough go, uh, even on a conceptual level. You know, like since that movie, and. I, I guess I bring that up because it is cool when these stories are successes, but do they shine a light maybe on a filmmaker that isn't as good as maybe you think that they are? Well, I think with, see, we like I said, the, the jury's still out on Oliver Daly because we don't know if he's going to get an opportunity to make another film. Sure. Uh, you know, time, time will tell. I think... To me, you ask me what I think about Neil Blomkamp. I think the Neil Blomkamp story is, it's, I'm not even, this isn't talking about the Kickstarter of it all or anything. His story just more sheds a light on the kind of filmmaker who I think comes roaring out of the gate with a really unique, amazing idea that they've obviously been thinking about for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then that hits and suddenly they're the it person of the moment. And then everyone's going, well, you've got more of those, right? And they go like, uh, uh, yeah, sure. (laughs) I've got other ideas. And I think with Neil Blomkamp, there's the pressure of, you know, it's almost like the worst thing in the world for him that District 9 was dominated for Best Picture. Sure. You know, that it wasn't just like a mildly successful genre film. Um, Suddenly everyone was like really paying attention to what he did next. And I think because District 9 was looked at as like, oh, not only are the effects great, but it has this really you know intense political messaging behind it. He felt like, oh, that's what I, that's who I have to be now. I have to mm-hmm. be political sci-fi guy. And so he does something like Elysium, which the messaging is like too on the nose, and the movie just falls on its face. You know, then yeah. he tries to pivot with Chappie, which I think to this day you're still the only person I know who likes that movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> And like, yeah, so I don't, I don't know. I think it's just more like I think he really struggled to try and recapture that District Nine magic because it's like the sophomore slump of certain bands. You know, yeah. you get their first album that they worked on forever, and then suddenly they have to make a second album. It's like, oh well, yeah, but we spent years honing that first one, mm-hmm. and now here's the second one that we threw together. Uh, we, we can call this the Nick Pizzolatto syndrome as well. You know, totally. Um, it's it's tough to it's, it, once you once you worked on it forever on the script for True Detective season one, it's pretty tough to do the follow up as we saw with him. So yeah. I think that's the Neil Blomkamp problem. Problem. did he work on that script for a long time or did he just plagiarize it for at least a weekend yeah well that's <laughs> another that's a whole another discussion thankfully we don't cover tv so we don't have to worry yeah, yeah, about yeah, yeah. it yeah. but i think you know that's that's a great way to to, to, to na- nail it down because it reminds me even of um you know gareth edwards doesn't direct a short film proof of concept but he makes a very low budget sci-fi film in monsters right and then that's Mm -hmm. a critical darling and then he gets godzilla and then he gets this and he gets star wars and then he's removed from star wars (laughs) like his career is odd too and then there's somebody like a james wan who makes Mm -hmm. saw for like a million bucks or whatever it is and then it makes you know at this point we did a success to series uh, listeners if you haven't heard it but we talk all about the saw series and that thing is now gross like over a billion dollars the whole franchise so there is success stories with hitting it big with something so small that takes mm-hmm. off and something that sat with somebody but then yeah in this case Oliver Daly who knows what he's going to do like yeah. Is this guy but blacklisted? That's, like nobody saw this movie, so I have no idea. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's the thing. Like this, this seemed like you know you talked about the box office of it and the fact that it just came and went, and also like I don't know if you looked even more into like the the company that made it. So the production mm-hmm. company is a company called uh, Global Road Entertainment, which was originally Open Road Films. Yeah, that was actually a distribution company that was actually um, created and at first like a joint venture of AMC Entertainment and Regal Entertainment. So mm. two theater chains got together and created this production company. Obviously, saying like let's just cut out the middleman. We'll make our own movies to show in our theaters you know and not give to the other theaters but then in 2017 open road was sold to tang media partners and it became global road entertainment mm-hmm. and that's you know the the company that ultimately uh, like unleashes axel on the world but like, let me read you chris i want to read you some <laughs> of global road entertainment's movies all right sure um the teen drama midnight sun starring bella thorne and patrick schwarzenegger okay, okay. family comedy show dogs starring will arnett sure uh, science fiction thriller The Silence, uh, and then the only one I've heard of, <laughs> the action thriller <laughs> Hotel Artemis, starring Jodie Foster and Sterling K. Brown. And I remember that, right. like, I kind of remember that, you know? Those other ones, like, 
sure i guess those movies exist because they're on wikipedia right yeah, but yeah but in, like there's other one like they also made one we called richard says goodbye a comedy drama starring johnny depp but that movie does not exist i'm sorry this is made up this can't be true <laughs> some, some uh, of these the science of fiction movie... romance zoe starring ewan mcgregor no come on these are like the these are like the <laughs> fake movies that are in other movies i just these but, these um, are the money laundering movies for sure well, that's the thing. So that when this movie came out, Axel, uh, right as it came out, Global Road had actually been taken over by its lenders, Bank of America and East West Bank, because mm-hmm. Donald Tang has, what turned out, had not raised enough funds for his purchase of Global Road. And, and so he had like uh, taken a bunch of loans and he wasn't paying back the loans and the banks actually took over Global Road. Oh, good. And they had a movie called City of Lies. And so they had two releases that were meant to come out in like the fall of 2018. One was Axel and one was City of Lies. Well, the banks stopped the release of City of Lies but they allowed Axel to come out. But of course, Axel didn't do well at the box office. And as a result, Global Road ended up having to like, lay off a bunch of its employees without severance, which their, their lenders required. Mm-hmm. And the company was like sudden, always all of a sudden looking to sell off the, it's, like, the rest of its upcoming slate. So yeah, this is a movie that uh, it, it eventually did kind of come back to some degree, but it, it's, obviously it's not a huge distribution company. But uh, like a couple weeks after the release of Axel, uh, Global Road's film unit just officially filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. So I, I say all that because you, you know, have this... purchased the rights for Axel. <laughs> yes, yes, I now own Global Road and Axel, <laughs> and of course Zoe, starring you and McGregor. Um, no, what I, I just bring that up because when you think of it that way, you're like, oh, this is, again, this is one of the stories of a movie that actually bankrupted its its company. You know, obviously mm-hmm. it's more complicated than that, but that is the kind of like albatross that could like sit on Oliver Daly, probably mm-hmm. unfairly, mm-hmm. right? But would somebody looking to like hire their next director go like, yeah, get the guy who made Axel, that one that like sent Global Road into Chapter 11. Even though it's not his fault, we know how dumb Hollywood is with this stuff. Totally. So it's tough to say if he'll get another chance. And of course, we'll talk in a moment about whether we even think, you know, creatively he should have one. But but yeah, it's it's tough to say. I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm not laying all of like, the, the production company's like problems at his feet. No, but I we know how it works, and it's it's really tough to say what his career will look like going forward. Obviously, it's truly a dream come true for me, um, and and I mean I'm good for the rest of my life if if I just get one. Honestly, this is just just amazing. So I I mostly just am humbled when I when I see just the incredible work and talent and art that's gone into an idea I had many years ago that I just decided I was going to pursue, you know, and, and, and the fact that it's taken off a life of its own. And, and now that it's, it's a separate thing from myself, or it used to just be an extension of myself used to be part of me is, is amazing. And even like, as of right now, I'm looking at his IMDb and the last thing he made was in 2020. It was a short film called Arcadia. Um, there is no plot. It's eight minutes long. And suffice to say, that's probably not going to get a feature. <laughs> so Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not holding my breath that we're going to see another big Oliver Daly movie anytime no. soon. But at the same time, the fact that this movie came and went and nobody even really knows it exists, maybe that's almost like a benefit to it, you know, or to him. Mm-hmm. I don't know, maybe he can kind of squeak by and maybe at some point he can create another short that does hit or another like kind of proof of concept thing and yeah. get more attention so who but who knows because i think you know obviously we're going to talk about it in a second but yeah suffice to say the you know there are there are big differences on a lot of levels between axel and district nine as well yeah. you know yeah. so that that's part of the issue as well yeah well you said that uh, nobody remembers this movie so i think uh we we have to remind people so yes uh let's talk about it Someone there? I'm not gonna hurt you. Let me get this out of right? What the hell are you? Introducing Axel, the latest in military protection, featuring facial recognition, onboard weapon systems, and owner pairing capabilities. It's paired now. The key gives them control of the entire project. Okay. You wanna play? Yeah. All right, let's go.
I want to show you something. Hello. You can talk to it? Yeah. Stay. You're a good boy. Can you survey everything I said? Flip it. Somebody spent a lot of money on him. They gotta be looking for him. I don't think his owner deserves to get him back. I need to know what it's doing. It's evolving way beyond expectation. That's my dog. I want him back. Launch the drones. Come on, he needs our help. What you should do is turn it in. It's not finders, keepers. You gotta stay down, all right? It's a robot, an intelligent robot. He feels things. I'm sending you the new location. Move in for retrieval. We're in this together. The acronym AXL stands for Attack, Exploration, Logistics. Created by the military, Axel is a top-secret robodog with advanced artificial intelligence. He has escaped his military complex and is discovered hiding in the desert by a young dirt bike enthusiast and mechanic named Miles. The two soon develop a friendship based on trust, loyalty, and compassion. Through their newfound kinship and the help of Miles' female crush Sarah, the trio will face off against Miles' motocross rival Sam, as well as the evil scientists who want their creation back. That's, you know, honestly, that's maybe the best plot synopsis you've done in a long time, just because this movie <laughs> has you. a very simple plot to, to, to cover. But, um, so, Chris, why don't you go ahead and I'll let you go first on this one. I know this, obviously, this is a first time watch for both of us, because this is yeah. a first time watch for anybody. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's six million bucks or whatever it made. It was like friends and family. You know, I watched crew. this on Tubi. And when I pressed play, Tubi actually put up a warning and said, are you sure? Are you, are you, did you mean to hit play on Axel? <laughs> we have thousands of other movies. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm OK, Tubi. It, but, it was the one on Tubi that there was no ads. <laughs> no, but yeah, even the even the Tubi companies were like, no, 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 we, we're good. Um, okay, right off the bat, I I totally get why this movie has been completely forgotten. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not gonna say it's like it's it's a piece of shit. <laughs> you know, it's not a movie that I was angry about or anything. Like, there's movies that we talk about on this podcast that make us like viscerally mad, right? And I think this one is just imitation over creation this movie keeps reminding you of a bunch of other movies it reminds you of short circuit it, you know it's it's it seems like it wants to be maybe an 80s throwback but it doesn't have the wit or the silliness or the charm to do that so it, it plays it too uh too cool for school uh, when it shouldn't and, and i bring that up because you know there's a movie that i really love <laughs> And, and Trev knows it, and, and it's a franchise that I have a really special place, but especially for the first movie, I genuinely think is great. And I know people hate this franchise, but at least people will most likely agree that the first movie is at least good on a lot of levels, and that's Transformers from 2007. And Transformers is boiled down to a boy and his car. And this movie is boiled down to a boy and his dog. Now, the difference why Transformers works, because this movie this movie apes so much of other things. Like, it apes the Iron Giant, it apes, you know, so many other things. But it really apes Transformers. And I think a huge reason why it doesn't work is our main character, Miles, is too cool. There's something about Sam Witwicky, played by Shia LaBeouf, that he's a goofball. And there's a charm to that. And he lacks confidence because he's kind of a dork. And here we have some of the basic instruments and tools used by 19th century seamen. (laughs) This here is the quadrant, which you can get for 80 bucks. It's all for sale, by the way. Like the uh, the sextant here, $50 for this, which is a bargain. These are pretty cool. These are my grandfather's glasses. I haven't quite gotten them appraised yet, but they've seen many cool things. Are you going to sell me his liver? Mr. Witwicky, this isn't show and sell. It's the 11th grade. I don't think your grandfather would be particularly proud of what you're doing. I know. I'm sorry. I just, you know, this is all going towards my car fund. 
You can tell your folks it's on eBay. I take PayPal. Cold hard cash works too. And, and the compass makes a, a great gift for Columbus Day. Sam. Sorry. Um. And when he finds Bumblebee, it brings his confidence back that he can actually, you know, get the girl and save the world. And in this movie, Miles already has the girl. She, she's, she wants him. <laughs> this guy doesn't lack confidence. You know, so what? Some guys, you know, make fun of him in the one scene and kind of embarrass him. But he's still really attractive. He's, 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 he's great at, you know, dirt biking. He's, he's cool, you know? And I think that there's, that's where the problems are for me in the movie is that it's trying to ape these, these movies, but there's no real character arc there because the main character doesn't change. The, mer- the main character is confident and cool in the beginning, and he's confident and cool at the end, which means Axel, the robo-dog, is meaningless. He's totally irrelevant to the character arc. So that's my main takeaway from the movie so far. And uh, you know what? I'll, we'll go into specifics, but I want to throw it to you and see if you agree or you disagree. We'll see. No, I agree with a lot of what you said, and I think even the the better like parallel to this, you know, because you you mentioned how a lot of people agree that the first Transformers movie is good. On that same level, I think almost everybody unanimously agrees Bumblebee is kind of like yeah the yeah. surprise, like really sweet, heartfelt movie in that series, and like mm-hmm. that's like I think Axel really wants to be what Bumblebee was, you know, like it's because like Bumblebee is also it loses like uh, you know same it's not year Michael too, Bay. eh? Same year, and it loses like Bumblebee. Obviously, lost a lot of like the the Michael Bayisms of Transformers. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, like yeah, the yeah. more extreme humor and the crazy, you know, uh, ultra violent action and things like that. And to just be more of a sweet story about a girl in her car. And I think this movie's playing on the same level. Uh, but I agree with a lot of what you said about the Miles character, because like, that's what I want to mention. And this is what I was trying to get to earlier in the in a, before the trailer, when we were talking about like what is Oliver Daly's career moving forward. I, I agree with you because I agree with you that this isn't like one of the worst things we've watched. Mm-hmm. And that's not offensively bad. And I think a lot of that is chalked up to it's a fairly well shot and like well made movie mm-hmm. on yeah. a director level. So I think you you do watch this and go, yeah, you, you know, actually this Oliver Daly guy has some skill. And especially with like this budget level, what he was able to pull off. But here is the ultimate paradox of Axel is that it's both really impressive that he made this movie with $10 million because it is like you look at this movie and you go like, wow, this is like pretty good for $10 million. But also the fact that it was only made for $10 million is its biggest, like, or one of its biggest problems. Totally. totally. Because at only $10 million, it also meant he had to, like, take this story down to its bare bones. And, like, it doesn't have, like, an exciting, like, third act. It doesn't have a huge action climax. It tries to, but with that budget level, it can't, you know? And it's one of those Mm -hmm. movies that only has really, like, if you track it and, like, kind of write it out, this movie only has, like, four scenes, essentially. Four scenes like, five (laughs) locations. You know, it kind of, it's a really inert movie. It doesn't, not much really happens from beginning to end. And you already covered the Miles thing. I want to tell you, though, Chris, I want to ask you a question. Um, Because you mentioned in your plot description... You said that uh, Axel, the robo dog, embodies advanced next generation artificial intelligence. And mm-hmm. I know why you said that, because the plot synopsis says that. <laughs> but I want to ask you does Axel have AI? Because there is no point in the movie that makes that seem like the case. They always talk about Axel as just a robot. Mm-hmm. And every like decision we see Axel make, every except for one, which I'll talk about in a bit, which is really weird. But for the most part, every decision Axel makes, every action he engages on, seems like programming more than intelligent decisions. Totally, he is like completely responsive to like prompted like things that have already been prompted in his programming, and that actually hurts the movie too because I never fell in love with Axel because of that. Mm-hmm. When the other characters are telling Miles, "Why are you so attached to this thing? It's just a robot." It's kind of like, yeah, they're right. Like, there's no reason to be that attached. I get that it's a robo dog. And obviously, we all were, you know, <laughs> we all love dogs and we're naturally going to be like, oh, robo dog. But, like, it is just a machine. And the movie doesn't do enough to, like, make it seem like anything more. You think about the great, the great work of, obviously, look, obviously, Oliver Daly and Axel is not James Cameron in T2. <laughs> but think <laughs> yeah, about yeah, yeah, how yeah, yeah. amazingly T2 shows the evolving intelligence of the T800, right? This movie doesn't pull that off with Axel. He just always seems like a robot, and so I never get emotionally attached to him. I completely agree, because even there's moments when the robot dog needs fuel. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, if he just runs out of fuel, then fuck, the movie's over. Like, like I just, like, if there's no, think of it this way, if there's no plot, you know, if that robot dog escaped and he never met Miles, 
they'd find him mm-hmm. and they'd find him not working. And now he's just a prop, right? Like that bothered me that you have to refuel him. And then also when he gets hurt, he needs to be repaired. And I was like, okay, well, if this wants to be Transformers, at least the Transformers are, you know, they're alien beings. So they heal in some way, shape or form. They repair each other or whatever it is, right? There's some sort of bio-organic thing going on there. And that would help if there was like some sort of like nanotech and I hate nanotech by the way you know that I hate nanotech but at least everybody this, knows you hate nanotech it's yeah, one of the most with everyone knows Chris hates uh, nanotech uh, na- nanotech is 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 such a uh, bullshit <laughs> get out of jail free card for so much of uh, of science fiction right now except but, Chris before before you go before you start ripping and say anything more can I at least get you to admit that the nanotech stuff in Jason X is awesome we get Uber Jason because of it. So you do get on. Uber Jason. Okay, 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 yes. okay. I'll, I'll give it to you there. I'll give it to you there. Okay. Um, at least if you had nanotech in this movie, it would make sense that Axel could heal himself, you know, and he could yeah. he can be okay without Miles. But because he's so intertwined with repair and fuel and everything, it's exactly what you're saying. He's just a machine that is a prop. There's no difference between him just being a car, you know? Like when Sam Witwicky meets Bumblebee, Bumblebee is a living organism. You know, he, he emotes. You can tell he's learning. You know, you can tell he's, he's understanding the world. And, you know, Shia does a great job. I've always said this about Shia, but he really sells those movies that he sells that that big CGI tennis ball is there. What is it? It's a robot. But like a, like a different, you know, like a super advanced robot. It's probably Japanese. Yeah. It's definitely Japanese. What are you doing? I don't think it wants to hurt us. Have we done that already? Really? Would you use speed robot? Because they just had like a giant droid death match. I think it wants something from me. What? Well, because the other one was talking about my eBay page. You were the strangest boy I have ever met. Can you talk? XM Satellite Radio. Digital Cable, Digital cable brings you. Your broadcasting system. So you, you talk through the radio? How do you do? You're, you're wonderful, you're wonderful. So what was that last night? What was that? That's just from Starfleet. Well, the inanimate vastness of things. Bring down like visitors from heaven, hallelujah. Visitors from heaven, what? What are you, like an alien or something? <laughs> Any more questions you want to ask? Who wants us to get in the car? And go where? 50 years from now, when you're looking back at your life, don't you want to be able to say you had the guts to get in the car? And I think in this movie, there's just not enough being done with to make me really care about this relationship. All right, you know? we get it. You like Transformers, we know. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, you know what? If we go back to Friday the 13th, you would go on a seven-minute diatribe <laughs> that I edited in for you. <laughs> but no, you're right, like, because you just said, like, it's true, like... And you brought up Jason X. That's so funny. <laughs> that, that is, well, it's one of the best ones. Uh, the, the problem is that Axel doesn't learn, right? Like, everything yeah, that Axel nothing. does through the course of the film is just orders that he's been given by Miles. And this would mm-hmm. be, it would be very easy. You know, this movie is already pretty generic. It would be very easy to just keep being generic and do the generic thing that all these kind of movies do, but it works every time of having Axel learn over the course of the movie that it's not right to hurt people. Yes. That it's not a weapon. You know, it was made to be a weapon. That's what you want to watch. That's what this movie should be about. This movie should be about Axel, the robo dog that was made to kill people, realizing, no, it wants to be a regular dog. That sounds like a good movie. Yeah. That's what I would, that, I would have liked that movie. That's, 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 that's the... J- Johnny Five in Short Circuit. That's the yeah. Iron Giant in the Iron Giant. Yes, like, I am what, not oh, a weapon. That's the T-800, you know? That's totally. What, like, that's... That, and then instead, this movie is just like Axel just only like well, Axel will hurt people. But if Miles, because he's bonded to him, says not to, then he doesn't. And that's mm-hmm. the movie. And it's like, OK, well, then he is just a tool. And this is the this is like the, the problem with it. And then because, like I said, the movie has a low budget and has to keep the story kind of compact and succinct and it's it moves so fast. Mm-hmm. You, there's And because Axel doesn't evolve in that way. There's no reason to believe that Miles would feel this bonded to it. Totally. You know, like the first time. So Miles finds Axel in the desert. It chases him. He gets scared. He runs away. And then he only stops because it fall like Axel falls into some wreckage and gets stuck there. 
So he gets brave enough to come up to it, and then he helps it, and then they bond. You know, when when, mm-hmm. when I say they bond, it just means and this is what I mean. Like Axel sees him, and because he's like taking, like um, getting him out of the wreckage, Axel's programming tells him, "All right, this is an ally." It even says that in his little RoboVision. It says ally. Yeah, yeah. And he and he, uh, he like sees him as ally, and then Miles finds like the key, this key that you press, and it bonds him to Axel. So now he's Axel's owner essentially, mm-hmm. and then. He stay, he, so he spends a day with Axel out in the desert, repairing him, playing with him. Then the girl he likes shows up, and Axel attacks her. You know, <laughs> then like Sam shows up later, his rival. Axel attacks it, attacks Sam. You know, it's like he has to keep stopping this dog from attacking people. And it's like, well, okay, then again, why are why are you so when when his dad is then like, I don't know, this, I think this thing's dangerous, and when Sarah's like, I think this thing's dangerous. Why is he so like dismissive of that? He should be like, yeah, you're right. Maybe I should yeah, just be- turn this thing back in. Yeah, because it's not alive. Yeah. Like at no time do you think that thing is alive and and another reason why you don't feel that is that there's no wow or wonder Mm -hmm. what's with that the first time you get a glimpse of axel in this film is 10 minutes in he walks from the left side of the frame it's at night he's far away there's a bit of a silhouette he presumably has escaped a lab and you don't really see it and you don't really know what it is and there's no sense of like why did he escape what the relationship is at the lab. Why does he decide to free himself? There's nothing special about him, right? It's as if you have a remote control car and you put it on auto drive, you know, and it just goes cruising down the highway. I don't give a fuck about that. You know, I need Mm -hmm. to know why. Why did this robot dog gain sentience? But as you are explaining, he never really does. (laughs) There is no sentience to this dog. He is a complete remote control toy and like i mentioned the only moment there's i said there's one moment where that's like arguable and it's actually one of the funnier moments of the week because it's so dumb and even this is like that and i have to say it's arguable it's still not it, it, i'm still not sure i'm ready to call this an instance of artificial intelligence and that's when um like axel's just kind of chilling off to the side and sarah and miles are having like a nice moment and axel sees them having a nice moment and decides to like start playing romantic music and then mm-hmm. beams like a light show onto them so they can dance and it's like, okay, that's really weird because why was this like killer robo military dog? Why, how would it have any concept to do that and have that idea? <laughs> yeah. But then even then, I don't, but then I'm thinking like, is that artificial intelligence? But like it's, it's basis for that comes from the fact, again, because we keep seeing through Axel's eyes. It's like, tra- it's tracking like, oh, it's tracking Miles and Sarah's, um, you know, like life functions. Mm-hmm. And it sees that suddenly both of them have like elevated heart rates and they're getting like hotter and it's like oh so axel as again as like a robotic programming thing goes oh these two are like romantically interested so i'll I'll set like a mood <laughs> it's a very weird totally. i was just thinking like why was that a part of axel's programming at all but and so and, and since since it's not in a better movie that could be the first instance where you go oh okay axel's actually starting to like develop something more than what he is mm-hmm. but there's no other scene like that and that's the problem and that's why i say like it, that scene sticks out like a sore thumb because after that the rest of the movie he's just again a tool that just does whatever miles programs him to do and again none of the characters react to it they don't see that it's weird they don't see that it's wow there's never a time like the first time that uh, miles meets axel why doesn't he go and pet its head and go oh, who made you you know, like, where are you from? Like, stuff like that. Like, he doesn't even have, like, just regular, you know, human, <laughs> like, uh, emotions to a gigantic robot dog. He mm-hmm. just accepts him because that's what the movie tells you to do. You know, the, yeah. the movie says this kid's got to accept this dog and you're, you're going to care about them because, because you do. That's the movie. Mm-hmm. And it just doesn't do the work. Um, one thing I will give it props for, um, let's get back to a little bit of the budget, by the way. Because we'll talk about some of the quote-unquote action scenes and how they all take place in a desert or a dark room. Uh, But for $10 million, this dog looks fantastic. Uh, The VFX, they nailed it. They nailed the lighting. It's a great blend between CGI and puppeteering. I um, initially did the short just with a CGI character, but I knew in the feature I wanted to use a practical animatronic puppet. I wanted the actors to have that experience of working with something that's on set. I wanted uh, to bring back that kind of craft to this genre um, and not get too lost in a fully CGI experience. 
that is something we don't see anymore. Um, and if we do, it's talked about ad nauseum, you know, like, hey, we got puppets again, you know, like how the, you know, the Disney Star Wars movies do that. But, <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, this movie had like a fully functioning, big life sized, uh, uh, Robo dog on set, mm-hmm. um, p- puppeteered by five or six guys. And, um, you can tell because these actors, you know, as kind of bland and mundane as they are, uh, it is nice for them to have something physical <laughs> and tangible to react to. Uh, it's not just a tennis ball, as I said before. As an actor, there's absolutely nothing better than having a full life size puppet of them because you can see the whole scale of him and uh, you can get up close with him, you can touch him and you can feel him and you can feel his response and if you got, if you slap him here, there's a guy that's right here that's controlling him that's gonna move this way so you have direct reaction to what he's doing at all times, his ears go up, his eyes move. I mean it's like a dream come true to be able to like work with that. There's something about uh, having something on set that is good And, and it looks good on screen, like I think the puppet actually looks great. Um, I like the design of Axel. I think, I think he, he gives a, there's a, there's a sweetness, there's a cuteness, but then there's a menace side to him as well. I was going to ask you about that. I was going to ask you if you think Axel's cute, because I think he's cute on like every single angle, except for when you look straight at him face wise. <laughs> like, like cartoons. And he's, got that, and he's got like that really creepy, like enforced yeah, yeah, yeah. smile. And it just looks like very, un, like, like, I don't know, very jarring. And uh, that for always sure. took me out of it. But. It's like when the Simpsons, you know, the old Simpsons uh, episodes, when they face the camera straight yeah. onto the camera and then just yeah. Bart looks like a mutant. Uh, it's like that. Yeah, for sure. But, but I do think the, the general look of the dog is cute and it's it is mm-hmm. smart to have and it's simple but the blue and the red eyes uh, i think does yeah, work and i actually re- really nice. like the detail too of when miles repairs axel and he takes a piece of his bike and like puts it on his shoulder that's cool so it gives axel that like little flash of color but also is something that like you know that that does more to like bond those two than like the script is doing <laughs> so <laughs> gotta give it credit for that yeah but uh what do you think about the villain well, which villain? Are we talking Sam or are we talking about the military guys? The military guy. Like the scientist in that room that he never leaves. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely one of those uh, uh, one uh, bad guy in a room movies. Um, well, he's also got – he also has the sidekick that looks – It's I know it's um, Lou Taylor Pucci from like the, the Evil Dead remake. Um, and, then, you know, it's, uh, there's something else. I, 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 mentioned, I, like I mentioned Simpsons and his last name's Pucci. I love this. Okay, keep going. Pucci. I think that's how you say it. It's P-U-C-C-I. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he looks a lot like um, Austin Butler in this movie. Like that's what kept, like, kept kind of oh, distracting me. Oh, I can see that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but the two of them, yeah, just in a room the whole time, um, tracking Axel. It's another one of those things where it's like the whole movie they kind of know where Axel is, and you wonder why they're not doing more. Mm-hmm. And it's that stupid like cliche of like, oh no, 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 he's bonded with this kid. Let's see what happens. Let's just watch it now. <laughs> but Chris, here's here's my problem with the villains. I don't want to tell the evil corporation that developed a a killer robo dog for military purposes their business. But a couple significant, um, like, production flaws here with Axel. <laughs> you right? don't say. So, first of all, you mentioned earlier Axel, when he's hurt, how he doesn't repair himself. Well, let's talk about how Axel does get hurt. Because this is a, a, a robo-dog that I assume has been made to be sent into war zones, right? Because mm-hmm. yep. he's supposed to be a military application. And yet we find out his one, his major weakness, fire. <laughs> like, Sam just, like, hits him with a blowtorch, and it just destroys him. Like, simple Trap, fire. trap, trap. Jet fuel melts steel beams. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the other thing that's, like, crazy about this movie is, as we said, at a certain point, Miles finds, like, Axel's key. And it's a key where she puts his, like, thumbprint on, and that, mm-hmm. a- that bonds him with Axel. So now he's Axel's sole owner and, like, the person who can give him orders. And so then when the military recaptures Axel... They also go ahead and capture Miles, and this guy is like, "Where's the key? Where's the key? We need the key." And like mm-hmm. he's like, "I don't know." He's like, "Cause he's hid the key, and he's like lying." He's like, "I lost. It. I don't know where it is." And I'm just thinking, you had no backup to this. There's no like secondary key, or there's nothing in the programming where you can like remove that bonding. That is ridiculous. <laughs> like, how dumb is this company that you would design this thing to only like bond to one person, and there's no backup plan out of that? It just mm-hmm. it's so this like thing. Like I I know it's just a movie, and I'm probably overthinking it, but like. The movie is like it, it. It does beg those questions because it's not giving you much else to think about, and it's just annoying to have such lame villains who are making such obvious mistakes. Well, I think that that the, there's a lot of adults don't understand tech 
or kids or social media in this movie. And I think that matters because what you're saying, like, oh, a keychain, that sounds cool and interesting. But then like you're saying, well, what if he loses the fob? Like we've all lost our keys. And what do you mean? I lose that key and then that dog is just going to go on a fucking rampage? You know, like, like it's, it's, there's no voice activation. There's nothing like that. Uh, even when, when, when Sam, the, the villain, uh, the jock villain and his friends go to burn up Axel, they're using like a steady cam, like normal Canon uh, camcorder or whatever. Um, and somehow that camcorder is live streaming, you know? Mm. And like, these filmmakers don't understand that that's not how Instagram works. <laughs> you know, you can't just use a camera and get 1.5 thousand uh, or 1.5 K live viewers. It's not how this works. Uh, a lot of the this lingo is very of, much like that. This movie has a lot of that. Like I get like the movie just like, goes like, you'll accept this, right? You're supposed to go like, I guess like there's a moment where Sam and all his friends, uh, they're like acting like they like miles. Cause so, so we should mention like mm-hmm, Sam, mm-hmm. Sam and miles are both motocross racers. And uh, recently, and like Sam, his family is like a big, like they're a rich and his dad runs a big like motorbike family or a, like a big motorbike team. And he's like the star racer for it. And then you have Miles, who it's just him and his dad, Thomas Jane, right? The, the little scrappy operation. But yeah. He's better. So he keeps winning races and this makes Sam mad. But Sam acts like he likes Miles. You know, it's the old uh, rich kid in a movie trick, you know, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. acts like he's his buddy, invites him to a party. Um, sucks up to him for a little bit and then goes, why don't you come out to the desert with us? And we as movie viewers know what's going on. We're like, oh, they're going to turn on him out there. But totally. Miles is dumb, falls for it. But I, I bring this up to get to another one of those points where uh, Sam like walks Miles away from his bike and we see one of his like little cronies pour an energy drink into the gas tank mm-hmm. of Miles' motorbike. And then she's like, oh, okay, so what's that going to do? Like, Obviously, it's going to make him like stall out or something when he's trying to do his stunt, right? But no, if you like watch the scene... He does the stunt, like he gets the bike up in the air, but then he just kind of like falls off the bike. And it looks like entirely a crash of his own making. <laughs> like I can't, <laughs> I could not figure out like what the energy drink in the gas tank had to do with it. Cause it's like, what if his bike stalls out in midair, that's fine, I think. You know, yeah. It's just like, I, it made no sense. Yeah, there's a lot of that. And I, and I understand that this is a this is a kids movie. Like, yeah. you know, it, when well, all things thing, like, are considered, like, it's a kids movie. So like afterwards, I was trying to think like, oh, who's the target audience for this movie? And obviously the target audience for this movie is 10 year olds. Right. Because like, yeah, 10 year olds are yeah. like, I wish I was friends with a robo dog. Like, that's the audience they're they're seeking here. But I guess for me as an adult man <laughs> watching this movie, I just felt it was imitating other things constantly, you know, like I know I keep bringing up Transformers, but I want to bring up Short Circuit a lot too. And, and the Iron Giant. And I think all three of those movies are fun and interesting and iconic in their own way. Right. And they have stood the test of time. And this one is just doing all of those movies and they're, it's doing it poorly. And it does one thing we talk about a lot on this podcast where, uh, it reminds you of something that you wish you were watching. You know what I mean? You didn't find Axel's sacrifice as moving as the Iron Giant's sacrifice? I know. You know what? A yo send it (laughs) is no I am Superman. I I want... (laughs) Chris, can I ask you... Is send it some like slang term that I somehow missed? It is. Or... Yes. Is it yes. really? Okay. As, as somebody as somebody who's a little bit of an age difference than you. Okay. Yeah. It, it, send it is very like Midwestern. It's very much a, a, a Canadian as well. There was this meme that was going around years ago of like this guy on a snowmobile. He's like, oh, I'm just going to send it. And he would just go over big hills and stuff. Okay. It's very much a, a motocross thing and stuff. Yeah. I don't know. I just woke up from a little nap. It's a little dark, but you guys silly. I'm still going to send it. <laughs> Well, that hurt, but the ET still runs, so round two. <laughs> He's tweaked. <laughs> Snow's too soft. Another day, another beer. Well, I guess I'll take back that that critique then, but I still didn't need to hear it 18 times this movie, and I yeah. certainly did not need to see a robo dog turn to the camera and go, "Yo, send it," and then blow up. Yeah, <laughs> and extend yeah. Like, have the movie expect me to start bawling. And again, it doesn't really work because he's just a remote control car at this point, mm-hmm. and also 
the movie takes place in the desert constantly, going back to your budget concerns, right? Like how much, the reason why the Iron Giant works is because the Iron Giant is like destroying the city. And then he kind of has to come to like, you know, he's short circuiting and has to be, he has to be brought back down to earth, you know, with a heartfelt, you know, with his, his little friend. And then he decides to do something for the better of the city. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But in Axel, there's like a helicopter that's trying to shoot him and then he just runs off. Yeah. It's also very, very predictable too, because I've, again, because I've seen movies and I have a brain, like, Mm -hmm. you know, as, as, as I do with all these movies, I was watching with my fiance and she was like, well, how do you think this is going to end? And I was like... Because we're, we were like saying, oh, it can't necessarily end with him. Like the military is after him. Everyone, the military knows who he is. They know where he lives. It can't just end with them going, I guess you can keep the dog. And I was like, oh, it's probably gonna be that dumb thing where like he'll put Axel's mind in like a thumb drive. And at the end, we'll see him building a new body for Axel. Now, I wasn't exactly right, but I was pretty close. Well, and that's the ending of I'm, Iron I'm, Giant. Yes, I know. <laughs> that's what I mean. And that's, the, that's a basic, like kind of the ending of like Tron Legacy, right? Like, yeah, it's all um, this. Yeah. But the movie also, like, even if as a, like predictable as it is, the movie like gives away its own twist because when Axel's running away from the, the military helicopters, again, we get to see his RoboVision and it shows that he's like uploading his mind into the cloud. Mm-hmm, and it's mm-hmm. like, oh, well, you just, you just told us. You just told us what's happening. So like when he sacrifices himself 10 seconds later, it doesn't matter to us. Like uh, this is basic filmmaking. Okay. Oliver Daly, if you're listening, like, we said, you know, I'm sorry, but we know you, we said you filmed it well and everything, but let me give you a little screenwriting tip. I know you can't go back and refilm Axel, nor, nor does anyone want you to, but if you were going to have Axel sacrifice himself without showing us the uploading to the cloud thing. And then after the sacrifice and the audience is crying, everyone's like, Oh my God, I can't believe Axel died. Send it. Ah. Then you cut to some, <laughs> military like second in command walk up to like his supervisor right and go like hey uh, something i'm looking at my readings here something strange like right before he blew up something was uploaded to the cloud that's how you do it you don't show us that yeah. first come on yeah, yeah it, at every point it rips the dramatic tension away right yeah um it's just a very paint by numbers movie like i, I oliver daly is fine at what he did, does i guess but this doesn't really do it for me <laughs> like you know what i now, mean like it's, can I ask it's you, totally though, the, fine the the one moment where thomas jane brandished a bow and arrow i to... wrote that down i wrote that down yeah. <laughs> did, yeah. did did you have punisher flashbacks oh for sure i said he, yeah. he uh, oh he gets another bow and arrow like he did in the punisher <laughs> yeah. that, he, he must have asked that right he must have requested because <laughs> the movie doesn't Wait, that... set it up it doesn't set it up he doesn't show that he was like a bow and arrow guy no so, yeah just it. suddenly has a bow and arrow pointed at a government agent yeah yeah, Do you yeah. think that Oliver Daly cast Alex Nudstatter as Miles and Alex McNichol as Sam because you can't spell Axel without Alex? Oh my god! I, I'm just a th- just a thought. Just a th- yeah, no, no. I the wheels are turning. <laughs> wheels are turning. You know, I'm I know a lot of things with the music industry, but uh, mm-hmm. Becky G never heard of her, and then I look and she's actually in the Power Rangers movie. I told um, you. I, I told you that, man. No, I know, but I forgot. Uh, I, I forget a lot of things you tell me. <laughs> yeah. uh, and she was just in Blue Beetle, so we might mm-hmm. be seeing more and more of Becky G as this podcast goes on. Well, I think we're gonna see and hear more of her because I think she's just a voice in Blue Beetle, but she's definitely one of the Power Rangers. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. She's a little bit of a smoke show. So. Yeah, she's a little cutie. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, and she's fine in this. Again, like there's nobody, there's no performance that's you. You said bland for some of the leads, and I would agree. Um, yeah. But there's no performance that's like, uh, you know, remarkably bad. Maybe the no. maybe the main villain, maybe that main guy, because he's just. I, and I only say that because I feel like he's not giving it like any kind of like dramatic oomph to mm-hmm. make him you know scary or hateable. But otherwise, everyone's just fine. It almost feels like everyone knows. They're in a movie that's being made for only ten million and is going to get dumped. You know what I mean? It's got this whole movie has the feeling, except on the special effects end. This whole movie has the feeling of people who know they're making a forgettable movie that's going to come and go. Yeah, you know, for for a movie about you know kids finding uh, finding a robot dog, there's no like youthful exuberance. You know, yeah. like nobody's excited. Nobody's like again, nobody wants to go enjoy going for a ride with Bumblebee. <laughs> you know, there's no scene of people having a great time experiencing a giant robot. Um, if you find a super cool robot dog in the desert, you're going to be having a ball with it. Like, there's none of that. They, they don't even do like a like a montage 
of Miles, like, literally throwing a ball, doing things that you do with dogs. You know, like, why not have that? And, I mean, it has to be a budgetary thing, right? Like, there there must have been so many ideas with the robot dog, and it's just a budgetary thing, but... Dude, there's not even a scene, there's not even a scene where Axel encounters a real dog. You're so right. What like, are we doing is. here? What are we doing here? You know, like... Yeah. And also, and also, why is it in a Transformers movie, you see Bumblebee pee, but you don't see a dog, a robot <laughs> dog pee, right? Let's see Axel take a shit and, like, you know, do, like, the little, like, like back it kick, go- you know, like dogs it, do. <laughs> it does this, it does this, it goes to take a shit, and you know how dogs do that little hunched over, like, they look like they're, like, they're really shameful when they're about to poop? Mm-hmm. And then it cuts a camera shot right to below their both the legs, and a bunch of, like, cogs and gears fall under. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> But uh, yeah, well, like, this... could I say, like, I didn't, like, I, like again, I know you don't like we're rewriting the movie now, which is yeah. a big thing of yours. But imagine Axel like meeting a real dog, and like the real dog like smells Axel's butt, <laughs> and then like That'd be great. Axel, and then like Axel does that, but then like blows steam on the dog and like scares it. Like, come on, like what are you? There is there is fun to be had with this premise, and I think because this movie is going through the motions, and and, and on, honestly, again, I, I don't think this movie really believes in itself. You know what I mean? So I go back to what I said about the short when I feel it was a little bit of a con job. (laughs) You know, Uh, was this idea truly a passion project that Oliver Daly has been thinking about for all these years? Or did he just watch Transformers and he was like, you know what gets made? You know, a boy and his dog movies. No, that's the thing. This is where, see, I'm trying not. I don't want. I'm trying not to be mean, but this is where I, I, I do think the limitations of Oliver Daly as like a creative are, are shown here. I, I mm-hmm. think probably what it is. I think Oliver Daly is clearly someone who enjoys like motorbikes, yeah, and also is like talented at special effects and likes tooling around in a computer. And I think that's the key to this, right? Like he, he, he wanted to. He likes filming like off roading. Uh, with, with motorbikes, and then he came up with this idea for a robo dog, and he put all this together. And then when he was like tasked with actually making it a movie, he was suddenly faced like, oh God, what do I do? Yeah. And all he could do is go like, well, I'll just copy all the other movies I've seen. And so that's where like he's, he like, I don't think this like movie pegs him as like a bad director, but I wouldn't let him necessarily write a movie again all by himself. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus, you you mentioned earlier, the one of the producers on this movie is David S. Goyer. I I found myself wishing that David S. Goyer had done like a polish on the script. Yeah. Because you know, like, I know David Square is a mixed bag, but he's had some really high highs, and you know he would make these characters more interesting, and he would add personality, and he would probably, like, some of the things we just mentioned, some of the obvious fixes, Goyer would have, should have clocked and could have done, and, like, could have fixed in a rewrite. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so having said all this, like, obviously we're not hot in the movie. I don't think we think it's this atrocious piece of junk, but I think it's just uninspired, I would say, mm-hmm. maybe, you know? But with the sequel tease... Do you like a robot dog movie? Like, do you like this kind of like, again, this throwback, this in, in more capable hands, this throwback to 80s cheeseball silliness? If it was more that vibe for a sequel, would you want that? Because like, I mean, I think the problem with this, again, is because it's it's too modern for this this uh, subject matter. If it, if it took itself less seriously, I think it would be more fun. But would you want to see more adventures of like a robot dog or this type of movie? It doesn't even have to be Axel too, but like another pass at a movie like this. Dude, what I, what are you talking about? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a man with a pulse. Of course I like the idea of a robot dog, you know? <laughs> like, But that's the thing. I mean, yes, this movie's generic. That doesn't even necessarily have to be a problem. You know, you and I both love plenty of movies that are generic on a certain base level, mm-hmm. but there's something about them that elevates them, you know? Like, heck, I just... Um, you know, to talk about a movie that actually did really well and obviously will get sequels, so we'll never have to cover. I just quite enjoyed The Beekeeper with Jason Statham. Right. Which is just a John, like another one of those like John Wick revenge riffs, riffs right? But it was like done, like, you know, it has tongue in cheek and had some really fun action scenes. Mm-hmm. So you can get away with that, you know? Um, so that's what you could make the same, you could take the same story of Axel and just make the small fixes we talked about. Make the main character have more of a character arc. Make Axel learn to be a real dog. Give each of the other characters a little bit more personality. And this movie would work just fine, and I would probably enjoy it. I'm not saying it'd be my favorite movie, especially since I would assume it would still be pitched to young kids. Mm-hmm. But I'd probably watch it and go, yeah, that's successful at what it's trying to do. And that's the problem with Axel is that it's not successful even at what it's trying to do. Yeah. Uh, but but to answer your question, like, yeah, of course I'm down with more Robo Dog movies. Give me all the Robo Dog movies you can. Like, it's a, it's a <laughs> fine concept. But before uh, before uh, we move on from that, though, Chris, I just wanted to quickly point out, though, because you said that nobody, you were just earlier saying, like, nobody went to the theater and was, like, enjoying this. 
I want to point out really quickly, speaking of SQL talk and the SQL tease, that there is currently a change.org petition to get a SQL made to Axel. Can, can I read you this petition? <laughs> yes, please, please. And this tell me petition, how many signers there are. <laughs> I will. I will. Don't worry. This petition <laughs> was created uh, by, uh, I won't give the full name, but by someone named Caleb. And they wrote, in 2018, I sat alone in the theater. Huh. <laughs> uh, in 2018, I sat alone in the theater and watched this movie. I thoroughly enjoyed every minute of it. I believe a sequel would be worth the effort. The movie had the perfect setup for a sequel. I'm sure that you have all seen a movie and prayed for a sequel. I'm hoping you'll support my wish for this movie to get a sequel, even if it's from an independent movie company. I'll accept any and all help. Uh, that petition was created on January 2nd, 2019. Caleb was searching for 5,000 signatures. Uh, today, he still only has 3,303. So hasn't quite made that 5,000 yet. But, okay. you know, it's only been, you know, five years. I'll, let's give him a little bit more time. Well, this will He's just waiting for the F2F bump. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's what, yeah. Actually, yeah. yeah. All of our listeners should go and change and go sign that change dot org <laughs> petition. Let's get like just wouldn't it be nice for him to like wake up one morning and see like suddenly he gets like a nice little bump on there? Yeah, yeah. No, Caleb's dead. I. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, great. I, I whether you, whether you're gonna go sign this petition or not, let me let me defer the same question to you though. How, what about sure. you? Where you fall on like just a you know well first uh, an actual sequel, but then beyond that like uh, uh, just Robo Dog uh, in general. Trev, I don't know how many times I need to say it, but I love. My giant robots. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. There is movies to come on F2F that we're going to talk about. There's movies that we just discuss regular, like, just like, in our personal life. Uh, you throw a robot, anything, and, well, I'm going to watch it. <laughs> so, Do you like, think I, if you would like this movie more, you would have went out and bought a RoboDog, just like how you went out and bought Bumblebee? Yeah, well... <laughs> <laughs> It's got to be as cool as my Camaro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's got to be cool. It's got to be sweet. Because there are um, actual robot dogs in the market. Definitely not as cool as Axel, though. No, 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 definitely not. But uh, but again, I do I do like the design of Axel. I, I thought it, I thought it was good. I, and and I would, well, that, and that's the damn shame, right? Is that this movie wasn't like didn't make enough of a blip to even get toys made, which is too bad because yeah. Axel would be a good toy. You know? Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, I uh, but no, I I think an Axel two with different people behind the camera and i'm not really super excited to watch another miles and sarah adventure with no. axel let's let's just um, put aside we don't want an axel too let's just say no it. like we no, don't okay need to fine i'll say it. yeah <laughs> okay 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 yeah uh but yeah but do, would we like to see sure. a different filmmaker tackle the same idea sure right this is an idea that could easily work with just a little bit more time spent on the script and honestly i just say because again i'm impressed with what he did with 10 million but this movie needs more than that to just allow for like more scenes with Axel fighting the military and more yeah. exciting kind of action stuff. Because if you're only making it for 10 million, all you get is a movie where you go like, hmm, that was kind of impressive for that. <laughs> but it doesn't allow you to get really into like very exciting sequences. How, how does an Axel go into people's backyards? You know, like they're, they're, they're in no time are they in a well-populated area ever. Yeah, They go to a gas to, like, station and that's it. He never has to like hide Axel, you know. You think about all the no. great comedy scenes in Transformers with Sam trying to hide. Now I'm now I'm you basically uh, yeah. trying to hide, you know, Bumblebee and Optimus from his parents. And like, there's not this movie. Does, that this movie, like, we just meant he doesn't hide them. We don't see Axel meet another dog. I think you said this earlier, but this this goes to what you were saying about Miles being too cool. This movie just for some reason is refusing to have fun. Yeah. Like, why is it? Why does this movie want to be so serious? Like, it's about a robot dog. Let it be funny. <laughs> Play with this idea more. Yeah, there's a there's a real lack of humor to mm. this, and it should be silly. Just yeah. be silly, because you know you're you're. There is one again scene the beekeeper. Of, Why did I like the beekeeper? Because it's silly. Totally, one hundred percent. And there is like one scene where I guess he's trying to hide the dog is when they're going to fuel up with gas, and then the dog starts to like manipulate an ATM and shoot out a bunch of money like through mm. whatever you know tech power he's got. And even at that, I was like, okay, that's kind of funny. Uh, yep. But there's but there's just not enough for for a hundred minute movie or whatever it is. You need more than that. You just absolutely need more than that. You need you need people to stumble across the robot dog and say just like it. They, they did that in fucking Mac and Me. Um, you know, with him, when he's when he's in the teddy bear costume, they're like, oh, that's yeah. a weird co that's a weird teddy bear you have there. Like, and then they even say it's a robot. <laughs> but it's like, why not? Why can't people see? the robot dog and say, Oh, that's a cool toy. Where'd you buy that? Oh, and they make a joke about it. There's just nothing 
nothing going on. What nothing we're trying on. to say is take Axel to a McDonald's dance party, damn it. Okay, kid, let's get this dance contest going. Uh, speaking of just like humor and stuff, there was one thing that did make me laugh, and it was unintentional, of course. But there's a moment where uh, Sam, the bully, is being a dick, and then Miles, like, six Axel on him, and then gets him on the ground, is like, you stay away from Sarah, or else, or else I'm coming for you, I'm gonna kick your ass. And, you know, he can't really stay away from Sarah, because Sam's, like, family employs <laughs> yeah. Sarah and Sarah's she, mother. She, like, lives in his, like, guest house. <laughs> like, it just seemed like such a stupid threat, and it's almost like the filmmakers forgot... <laughs> That, like, oh, I think the movie yeah. did forget that because at the end of the movie, when we're getting like all the wrap up montage, there's nothing to like because like Sarah goes off to college, she goes off to art school, and Miles right. comes with her, right. and then that's where like we see them out on the beach, and they've got now they got a puppy, and then they their phone rings, and it turns out Axel is like texting them his brain essentially, um, <laughs> but but like the whole time that I'm just thinking like, wait, did Sarah just like leave her mom still working for that shitty family, like? Because the movie just forgets about that. Like, yeah. so. The answer is yes. <laughs> the answer, uh, the answer is yes. yes. Uh, can I tell you the, another moment that made me laugh? Uh, like another unintentional laugh? Uh, sure. It's a small thing, but good. I, at this point, I was, I was like looking for anything, right? <laughs> um, there's another scene like later on where, it's, again, Sam and his like cronies are like back at like the gas station. Uh, or like it's the gas station or like a convenience store. But his like, his like gang is coming out of the store. And, like, the new hot girl that he's, like, replacing Sarah with, mm. she, like, jumps off the curb right in front of a sign that says no jumping. And I was like, <laughs> is the movie trying to tell me that they're, like, young rebels? By <laughs> it's like, oh, look at that. She jumped where she's not supposed to jump. Like, that's I was seriously wondering is, like, is the movie that dumb where it's like, yeah, what a bunch of punks? Honestly, I bet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that felt right. Yeah. Well, I, I, listeners, if you want to seek out Axel... Um, you know, it's available. You know, yeah, someone, it's there on, I, like I said, it's there on Tubi, you know. Yeah, so. It, it'll it, be there till the end of time. Trust me, Tubi yeah. will not, Tubi probably doesn't remember they put it on there. So. No. They're not no. going to remove it anytime soon. No. Just like Thomas Jane probably forgot he was in this movie. Uh, we While will, he was filming it. Oh, dude, he looks like he's sleepwalking, eh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, it's, he's in it for like three scenes and uh, probably shoeless. <laughs> fucking weirdo. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, just like he forgot he's in this movie, we're probably going to forget it uh, once I'm done editing this thing. <laughs> so, yeah. Next, uh, we're going into a new theme. New theme. Uh, very exciting. Very exciting. We are leaving Frenduary behind, and we are going into Monster March Madness. Uh, Trevor, are you into March Madness? Mm, nope. <laughs> Same here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Not a, so, not a basketball guy. So No, me neither. Um, so we are taking it back. <laughs> we're making it Monster March Madness. And on March 12th, we're going to be looking... This is actually be pretty special. Um, mm-hmm. This is the second time ever uh, that we are having guests on the podcast. Um, we did that last year, I believe, uh, with, uh, with our friend Jackie. Uh, we did uh, Vampire Academy. So go listen to that one. But yes, March 12th, we are doing Godzilla from 1998. Yep. The Matthew Broderick blockbuster spectacular. Yeah, so um, I decided to invite a couple of my buddies on, um, and that is Kyle Bird and Matt Parmley, who are the hosts of the podcast Kaiju Transmissions, a podcast devoted to Godzilla and other kaijus, which I have been on multiple times. And in fact, mm-hmm. it's ironic that we're leaving Frenduary because Kyle Bird is actually one of my like oldest friends, one of my, my longest friendships. Uh, and I honestly, uh, actually my original podcast partner, him and I for years had a podcast together called If It Bleeds, We Can Kill It. Um, but yeah, so it's exciting to bring them on. They are kaiju experts and they will definitely have much to say, I'm sure, about <laughs> Godzilla 98. Whether it'll, yes. any of it will be stuff I haven't heard them talk about before, probably not. But hey, you know, yeah. I'll, it'll I'll be, sit through it again. It'll be new for me. And yeah. uh, uh, I, I, I know I've met one of, uh, I think I met Kyle uh, mm-hmm. years ago when I visited you in Michigan. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, I'm, I'm really excited for that. Really, really excited. Yep. Uh, but after that, uh, March 26th, we are doing Dragon Wars colon D-War from 2007. <laughs> One of the best titled movies of all time, clearly. Yes, yes, yes. One of the titles of all time. Um, yeah, so, I mean, Monster March Madness is going to be fun. Like, it's going to be great. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that for sure, for sure. I mean, yeah, after Axel, I think anything just seems like it could be fun, you know? Like, just a reminder the movies can have fun again. <laughs> 
I mean, it was a one-two punch of Mac and me and Axel for sure that uh, yeah. made Frienduary interesting <laughs> to say the least. You know what? I hate the concept of friendship now. Thanks. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I'm dropping you like a hot potato right after this. <laughs> uh, follow along at F2F Pod. That's at F2, the number two F Pod. That's on all the socials. Like us there. Like us everywhere. Uh, rate review whatever you do. Throw us a star rating. That'd be great. And uh, join the tribe and hit that subscribe. Uh, because we're going into March Madness, big and loud, and it's going to be a lot of fun. And Chris, can I just remind you of one last thing? Sure. Once you, once we've once we're done recording here, you've got the edit all together, and you've put in all your clips and everything. Don't forget to go on online and yo, send it. I hope they go home and give their dog a kiss. <laughs> you know, I mean, that would be great. Uh, I, I, I hope they they have a heart opening experience that uh that they can talk about with one another i hope they can think about it after they see it and they want to rewatch it i i hope that uh you know people have a really good time and feel like they they spent their ticket money and their popcorn money and a good thing